after the department was formed about five years ago, we decided that uh, we really should celebrate um, when people uh, got professorial titles. Initially, the idea was for people who had done it from within um, the department and who'd been uh, given a, um, a professorial title. Um, and I think we can still say the same of Philip, uh, because although we did recruit him back from Australia, where he was in Sydney and Melbourne, uh, doing fantastic work, uh, he has, as he says on his um, uh, bio on the website, rejoined uh, the Health Economics um, uh, Research Group to, um, uh, to take over the, the leadership uh, from uh, Alistair Gray, uh, who formed that, and I think fancied a bit of a rest. Um, I also uh, know he had a very busy day yesterday because he was running a meeting um, celebrating the 60th uh, anniversary of the Hinchcliffe Report, um, and it was a fantastic meeting uh, with economists, clinicians, and uh, I did actually learn an enormous amount about economics. Um, and I had a lovely talk from um, Amanda Adler, who described um, what she uh, wished she'd learned about economics at medical school. Um, but she also said that part of her attraction to coming back to Oxford from Cambridge uh, was the opportunity to work again uh, with Philip. Um, so did, we not only got one back, we got two back. <laughs> and Philip, it's an absolute pleasure to have you in the department and really looking forward to you talking about uh, diabetes in the 21st century. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. I uh, appreciate it. So these talks obviously are, uh, I think, covering a very broad canvas, probably mine may be larger than, than others in terms of, because I, perhaps uh, I've tried to not only perhaps give a, a, uh, a, a, some information about diabetes and how we can improve care and the economics of diabetes, but also perhaps a little bit about my life and my interests, in, including perhaps uh, an interest in map collecting, which I'll show you in a minute. But perhaps to start with, a, a, a year ago, we had, I think, a typical, I suppose, academic dilemma, which is kind of where you live in Oxford. And there's obviously, life as always, an economist will tell you, is about trade-offs, particularly in Oxford with the cost of housing. And so one of the areas we looked at was in St Ebbs, which was very close to actually where I first arrived in Oxford uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was actually on the other side of the river and, and St Ebbs is on the, in Grand Pont and this is obviously on the St Ebbs side. And uh, I started to do some research and of course perhaps the first bit of due diligence that Alistair advised me was have a look at an Oxford flood map and I think actually today <laughs> there's some uh, merit in actually that, or that advice or some worth in that advice as the river's starting to rise higher. But I'm assured in the 20 years that our next door neighbours have been, it, it doesn't, has never been over the banks. Uh, so. Um, what one, and part of my research, I very quickly came across a map and uh, being a map collector, I suddenly forgot about the flood map and started to think to look at uh, this um, a map. And it was by the Regis Professor of Medicine uh, in 1856. It's not well known, but it's actually only published a year after John Snow's uh, famous map, although it wasn't famous in his lifetime, of his cholera map, of, uh, which of course uh, uh, try, or was useful in detecting the source of cholera using the pump. In, uh, in Broad Street Pump. Well, I think Ackland uh, did try to do the same. He basically plotted out the cases, and this is, uh, has had a wonderful map. This is obviously, and hopefully we'll get the, this is South Oxford and St Ebbs, this is North Oxford, and he plotted out the cases. So if one looks at South Oxford, uh, this, the outbreak was in Gas Street, uh, which is just uh, in, in the middle of St Ebbs. And as you can see around the prison, there were, were a very large number of, of cases. I think one of the things that made it more difficult for Ackland, as opposed, is there wasn't a single source, because I think the river was obviously the vector of transmission. Um, but also, I think even when one, one starts studying from a map, you can start to see kind of interesting sort of um, uh, health issues beyond the outbreak of cases in terms of the distribution of cases. They're not randomly scattered. They're obviously along the river. But when we moved to North Oxford, and this is Jericho, uh, or near Jericho, that's uh, Nelson Street. Uh, interestingly, there are almost no cases in North Oxford. In fact, the only case 
I can see is in the workhouse, which is actually now the site of the university offices uh, in Wellington Square. That's a little Clarendon Street. Uh, and so if you look, the, the really, the, you know, what this map shows, one was cholera was a very big problem in cities even like Oxford, but it wasn't uh, it, it sort of an even, uh, you know, the, there were, it, what the burden wasn't shared equally across the community. It was very much a disease of poverty and St Ebbs was very much uh, a place where there, there, there were lots of, of uh, small houses and there was sort of, as it were, slum clearances in the 1970s. Uh, for, and so uh, unlike uh, perhaps Jericho, St Ebbs doesn't have the character that, uh, that uh, some of the North Oxford or similar sort of suburbs in, 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 or, uh, in, North, in North Oxford. Um, and so you can learn a lot from just a single map, as it were. Uh, and, uh, um, but you can also learn a lot from what came with it. So I went and, after seeing the map, I went and located the book of Ackland's book. And he has alongside this map a quite extraordinary uh, sort of a, a, a attempt to try to locate or to try to look at correlations with a whole lot of uh, climactic <coughs> uh, factors, as it were, environmental factors. So effectively what this is, and this is, you, I uh, must stress, this uh, was created, this uh, uh, figure was created in the 1850s, effectively plots out daily uh, cloud cover, wind speed and direction, air pressure, degrees of moisture, rain and temperature. And this is he's trying to look at sort of uh, correlates and obviously to thinking about the sort of what was known as the, the miasma theory. But he was actually trying empirically to look at data. And I think one of the things, and one could, uh, as an exercise, read in this data and start to use computers, but you'd have to say visually there's actually relatively little correlation, except possibly with temperature down here, with this being the outbreak of cases and the black being the number of deaths. But he was basically, I think, very much using an approach that we would use today. And in fact, uh, one of the projects we're interested in looking at uh, is looking at the uh, effects of air pollution on health. And of course, one's using very similar approaches to what Ackland would today with different data. So again, okay, perhaps turning to where does the economics come in? Well, it comes in pretty quickly in the uh, 1860s. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, there was a, much interest in, as it were, the value of human life. Uh, and I'm interested in perhaps history as well as maps. And so one can very quickly, if you search uh, newspapers of the time, uh, and, in, and in Australia there's an extraordinary resource called Trove for things like the value of human life, you very quickly come across really interesting sort of, uh, 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 of, of a clearly economists musing on how you value life, which of course we still do today. But this is perhaps uh, a, a wonderful sort of snippet to share. So in the 1860s was a time of the American uh, Civil War. Just towards the end, there was an explosion in Mobile, Alabama, killing 300 people. And this article says, well, if a similar catastrophe had happened, say, in Oxford, we should not have heard the last of it for weeks. The intrinsic value of Oxford, both in the architectural point of view and the quality of its inhabitants, <laughs> is doubtless greater than Mobile, Alabama. So it's, it, obviously this was a time when Americans, and I'll, you'll see this a couple of times, didn't quite have the same value they do today. <laughs> so interestingly, again, alongside that, there's uh, just afterwards, and I think it may be, and unfortunately, they're both anonymous, uh, um, but it may be the same author, possibly Walter Baggett, but it's hard to know, um, amusing about how you might value human life. And it says, what is the fair, fair uh, average value of a human life? Let's assume, for example, a party of men are shut up uh, by some accident in a mine and would only be saved by the profuse expenditure of money. Would it be right to spend 100, ahead, 100 pounds a head in order to save them, or a thousand or a million? The lowest of these would obviously be too small, the highest would be too great, if only because the same amount expended in a different way might do infinitely more good than the permanent, uh, by the permanent removal of some cause of danger. How do you fix the terms of the equation? And this is very much what economists still, uh, more than a century later, this is the, the kind of uh, trade-offs we, we are making. Perhaps I would say, perhaps what has changed is, of course, if you are, are in a mining disaster, you want a television crew, and this is the <laughs> very famous Chilean mi mining uh, disaster where all of their lives were saved at profuse expenditure of money. And, but, but, that, uh, but effectively, we face these same trade-offs today. And interestingly, alongside uh, the, the, well, these sort of musings in uh, newspapers, there were attempts, in particular by William Farr, who most people would know of, uh, as I suppose a demographer and creator of the first life tables, 
Uh, but alongside creating a life table, he tried to place a value on human life. And what he basically did was what people, economists would call use human capital methods, looked at the value people created through uh, their production. So he basically valued an agricultural labourer, and it's about 100 and I think 70 pounds he valued it at using a sort of life table methods. Uh, and economists, uh, I think, have moved on from that, and of course the value of life has risen, but effectively we're trying to do similar sorts of calculations today. Um, and then looking even sort of further forward, I think, and trying to perhaps relate it directly to cholera, um, the, w there were obviously uh, you know, enormous advances from the, uh, as it were, sort of 1880s with the Public Health Acts that cleaned up the uh, water supply in the, in the United Kingdom. And I found by chance a, an economic evaluation where at, uh, contemporary to the time in 1891 in the uh, American Statistical Association, and effectively what they do is try to value you know, the, the change. The Public Health Acts were introduced, I think, in 1874. This is the mortality rate before. This is the mortality rate afterwards. Interestingly, it wasn't, there's not a huge effect, but you would say if you ran a regression on that, you probably would get a statistically significant result. And we know today that people would regard the, the, uh, 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 the, the sewer system as one of the great sort of public health advances of the 19th century. But they then calculated the number of uh, persons saved, they multiplied it by the values that uh, William Farr had given them of 175 pounds. And uh, if you translate that today, it's around 80,000 to 280,000 pounds, depending on your way you might uh, translate it. Uh, so they calculated the total cost, and this is straight out of the original article in US dollars at the time, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about this more uh, later, at about half a billion US dollars. It was a substantial amount of money, and they calculated the total benefits at just a bit greater. I think what they kind of forgot, if I was to be a sort of critique with the benefit of hindsight, of course the Victorian sewer system is still with us, and is still benefiting us, so clearly the the, uh, the, you know, the, the benefit, they severely underestimate the benefits, but what they did show was that it basically was, was beneficial and it was an argument and picked up in the US in particular to, uh, to, to sort of justify the uh, sort, of sort of extension of, uh, of, I suppose, sanitation and uh, uh, sewering parts of the United States. So perhaps to link uh, the, ninth, the 19th century with what the, some of the uh, challenges we face today, um, is I suppose we've got the 20th century in between and I'm always, I would regard myself as fairly 20th centuryist that I do think it was an amazing century and it was a good time to be alive in as it were. Um, and partly because if you think with the, again if we were maybe in 500 or 1000 years time and writing a history book, I do think these two photos of uh, the first plane, the first flight in Kitty Hawk, uh, North Carolina and the earth rise, and those two images are only separated by 67 years, is quite extraordinary. And I don't think we'll quite see that again. Of course, you other, in, in, a lot else happened in the 20th century. Uh, of course, for example, universal suffrage and other social movements, a lot of bad things happened as well. But if you were thinking about technologies, again, from the perspective of 500 years time, I suspect we might see a computer. Um, uh, and if we were thinking about medical advances, Possibly, and I think there are many candidates in the 20th century, but one of them may well have been the discovery of insulin in 1923. And so if we turn to that again, uh, using the trove as a, um, uh, as a for the, the Australian sort of uh, search engine to search for the term insulin, I came across uh, a very you know, fascinating article for a, for a number of reasons. Uh, soon after the discovery, which was in 22, uh, of course, I think what is extraordinary here is one that they had the speed of winning the Nobel Prize, but also the speed of translation of the, that, that uh, they were making serum. Now, what one of the things, interestingly, the uh, discoverers, Banting and Best did was that they sold their patent rights for insulin to the, to the uh, University of Toronto for a single dollar, Canadian dollar, and the University of Toronto went round the world uh, licensing it to various authorities. In Australia, uh, they licensed it to what became the Commonwealth Serum Laboratory. In the uh, UK, I believe it was licensed the MRC on the basis that you didn't make above the cost of producing it. So actually the cost of insulin 
fell. Initially, it was quite expensive, and uh, this is again converting. It was $96 Australian, so about 50 pounds, and it dropped down to about 10 pounds per week. So it's an interesting, again, with the, all of the debates about life-saving drugs that are going on today, it's interesting to reflect, a century, almost a century ago, inventors faced a very similar, uh, I suppose, uh, issues and had a very different approach, but it's something we should perhaps reflect on at the 100th anniversary in a couple of years' time. So one of the bits of research, and I finally got to my own bit of academic research or contributions here, was to try and think about with a disease like type 1 diabetes, actually perhaps I would uh, stress the other thing, when, and uh, of course was the sort of headline that they announced was that they had a cure for diabetes, which was uh, given that and in the case of type 1 diabetes, which was what they were treating, was in a very fatal disease with a prognosis of in weeks or months, it perhaps wasn't a bad characterization. But as we would know now, uh, those on insulin uh, uh, still had a very high mortality. And what we did uh, a few years ago was try to get all of this uh, estimates of what uh, uh, I suppose epidemiologists uh, used to try and look at uh, the risk of uh, or relative risk of populations. What we did is uh, got all of the studies characterising what's called a standardised mortality ratio, which is comparing one group of patients with the, a standard mortality in that population they're from. And what you end up with is uh, in the early studies, you end up with uh, a, a six-fold increase in risk, which is very large. You would live 25 years less. But if you're basically going to die within a few weeks, living into your 40s, I think it was a, a really significant advance. But when we basically stratified these and estimated these separately, we got a significant reduction or closing of the gap over the 20th century. And now the gap is around three times. Still a very large risk, still that risk needs to be removed, but it's clearly a much better deal to live uh, to now uh, having type 1 diabetes than, in the, than uh, at the early part of the 20th century. And again, uh, what we've done using Swedish uh, data, uh, registry data, is calculated these gaps and calculated, and it's still around 10 to 12 years, uh, with some evidence of it closing, although I think uh, for men, not for women, and it's something, again, I think one needs to work very hard on to think about ways to close, to close these gaps even further. Um, one of perhaps my own experience with uh, type 1 diabetes was my mother had type, type 1 diabetes, uh, diagnosed in 1967. This uh, is a photo of uh, her and in fact our family, including my sister who's here, who's, uh, was, uh, and it's uh, us coming to Australia with that being the Harbour Bridge. My other sister who's actually ended up, who can't be here, but uh, ended up in academia as a classicist, I suppose, a true academic, and myself here uh, <laughs> with no memory of uh, this sort of, uh, 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 of this scene, but, but I do uh, know what I'm looking at and I'll perhaps return to that at the end. And if you've been to Sydney, I, I, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to guess. And this is my, the, my mother towards the end of her life, and I suppose the question, she lived uh, for almost 50 years with diabetes into her 80s. As you'd know from the uh, statistics I had shown you before, that is, that is quite unusual. And so it, the question, I suppose, how much was it luck and what, what <laughs> can she attribute it to? And the first thing, interestingly, and she had this, told this story many times to me, she can attribute to she didn't smoke, but it was actually against the advice of her GP because when she was diagnosed in 1967, and this should be quite significant for this department in New Zealand, what the doctor said was described as she had to give up sugar and carbohydrates, but she suggested she take up smoking, and when uh, there was a dessert, she could have a cigarette, and she didn't follow that advice, and probably lived an extra few years to, to tell that tale. But also, of course, what had an impact on her life was being able to monitor blood glucose, and I can have a very distinct memory of that, of her starting to do that from the 1980s, allowing her better control. She had a heart valve operation in 2006, and by the end, she was on multiple medications to prevent uh, cardiovascular disease, at least uh, two blood pr pressure medications and uh, a statin. Uh, so, and cl clearly, I think, uh, as you'd see, we, I think there's now substantial evidence that, of course, there's luck in life, but there's also a lot of, 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 of medical interventions that uh, w increased her, her uh, survival and, uh, for that matter, quality of life. And again, uh, perhaps uh, thinking just uh, going even perhaps further than the 20th century, um, going back um, into the 19th century and comparing it with the 20th, 
there's some wonderful data, particularly for countries like France, where you can get life tables going back to the early part of the uh, 19th century. And again, as you can see, uh, this is the probability of dying uh, for somebody aged 30 in France over a period of 200 years. It's pretty easy to spot both World War I and I think what might be the flu pandemic at the end of the war, World War II. Um, but also I think uh, you can clearly see very large trends uh, across the 20th century that led to these large increases in longevity, not just occurring I mean, initially early in life, but then in the, towards the latter part of the 20th century, even more so uh, for, uh, 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 for the you know, later years in life. So I suppose one of the areas that I'm interested in, and uh, graphs like the for former, they're sort of tantalising because that's giving you the average. So if you're interested in inequalities, you're interested in moving beyond the average. And what we know about inequalities, uh, and in particular in the last uh, year or two, has been sort of driven by, say, the work of Thomas Piketty and other researchers, uh, where we're trying to look at long-term trends in uh, the wealth or income of people in high income. Uh, versus the uh, perhaps uh, people on low income or middle incomes. And here's a graph over the same period of time showing that there has been, uh, as it were, particularly at the early part of the 20th century, closing of the gap in wealth between particularly uh, the, the top 10% and the bottom four, or the middle 40%. Perhaps the bottom 10% got a bit more, but not, not that much. Although clearly in the last few years, these trends have started to reverse. Now, one of my arguments might, uh, you know, would be that uh, the rise of chronic disease is contributing to inequalities. This, I think, if I was handing out a graph of the year for 2015, I would have to, this would have to be a candidate. And what the researchers have done here, uh, which was published in Diabetes Legia, is they basically uh, um, have uh, plotted out the prevalence of uh, diabetes in the United States. And as you can see, this is an upward inexorable rise this red bit here, I would presume, I mean, obviously things have accelerated, but partly I would suspect it's due to screening uh, bringing on earlier cases. But it is clearly the proportion with diabetes uh, now is dramatically larger than it was in the middle part of the 20th century. And alongside that, some work we did in Australia was trying to think about, well, how are these uh, trends changing over time and prevalence? Uh, and also how do they change across income groups. And apologies for this, a slightly small slide, but hopefully. So what we've done here is plotted out the prevalence of all the major cardiovascular risk factors in Australia across, uh, as it were, various surveys. All of them have this slope, which uh, people call a socioeconomic gradient. Uh, so, you know, if you're uh, uh, basically in high income group, you've got a much lower uh, prevalence of any of these risk factors. Uh, what is perhaps uh, good is that the trends, uh, uh, there have been positive trends in some of these, and I think uh, if we'd gone on, it, it should also have been in cholesterol. Uh, but uh, that's not universal. Diabetes, obesity, and over uh, being overweight have all been increasing. Smoking, interestingly, perhaps just to make, make as an aside, uh, definitely has been uneven in terms of the, the, those giving up smoking, and I think that's a continuing, a continuing challenge, as, as it were. Um, but I, but I, so I would argue there's pretty strong evidence that chronic disease could be one of the causes behind this sort of widening gaps we've got uh, from, from in that previous figure, but in the, basically in the, uh, as we're moving into the, to the 21st century. So, well, what can be done? I'll focus primarily on diabetes. So I will perhaps uh, acknowledge uh, that, you know, first and foremost, it, it, uh, Look, there are obviously effective ways to prevent diabetes, both at an individual level with uh, diet and exercise, also uh, at a societal level, including work done by Mike Rayner and others in this department with things like sugar taxes. And ultimately, uh, you know, they are ultimately a good way to drive change at a population level. My research, I think, has primarily been perhaps focused more at the individual level and more at the treatment end. But it basically, I suppose, there's no question they go, prevention and treatment go hand in hand. But if you're trying to sort of, I suppose, tackle the, the disease now, you, uh, it's a good place to start is trying to improve treatment, partly because of the large amount of evidence of effective treatments that exist, that didn't exist 10, ten years ago, both or, or 20 years ago, both to increase uh, quality of life and uh, survival. So turning to diabetes and perhaps my first uh, 
time in Oxford, uh, which uh, was at the beginning of, or in June 1999, I came to work on one of the long-term studies here. Uh, it was originally headed by uh, 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 Robert uh, Turner, who uh, tragically died in, uh, uh, actually within a month or, or so of my arrival. Uh, and, um, but uh, uh, other people who are in this room, who are uh, uh, Ruri Holman, Amanda Adler, uh, David Matthews, and of course Alistair, all worked on the study. Uh, and it was as a sort of collaborative team. The uh, main UKPDS 33 paper uh, has around 20, well, I looked up today, 20,000 Google citations. So it was clearly had an impact, as it were, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the highest cited diabetes papers. I think it, it changed practice, but perhaps beyond just practice on blood glucose, there was an increase in recognition at the time, partly driven by the blood pressure uh, randomization that was an embedded randomization, uh, was that it wasn't only about blood glucose, that you could uh, improve quality of life and survival of people with diabetes by tackling other risk factors. And obviously in the UK PDS, blood pressure, but of course subsequently a lot of work done here in Oxford and with the HBS and other studies has shown tackling uh, uh, lipids and uh, using cholesterol lowering drugs have been a great combination uh, to, to improve uh, qu the quality of uh, care of people with diabetes. So I have a very distinct memory of Robert uh, Turner uh, presenting this graph, uh, and of course, this uh, graph is uh, uh, wasn't the primary endpoint in the study, which was significant, but it was of all cause mortality. And I remember him saying that uh, you know uh, that it it, 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 it didn't it, in any sense reach conventional level of significance. But of course, when one looks at the graph, one's eye is drawn to the fact that there's a long period, and this is measured in years. Of, uh, the, of mortality being the same in the two groups and some separation. And perhaps if there's ever an argument for why you might undertake extended follow-up of a study, uh, the next graph will perhaps hopefully convince you is that once you start to follow up over the decades, you do get a very strong signal that there is a, uh, an improvement for, in this case, a very sustained long-term improvement in blood glucose from uh, diagnosis of diabetes, there is an improvement in uh, mortality uh, with a reasonably high, high uh, level of significance. Uh, and so, you know, that, uh, um, you know, clearly uh, uh, since then there have been many trials. Most have been very short-term trials and haven't shown these sort of benefits except perhaps the most recent generation of drugs, but they've certainly shown ways to improve complications with diabetes. Um, perhaps, again, another reason one, why one might signal out the UKPDS as an important study was actually the, it was one of the first studies, uh, randomised trials, to have integrated health economics prospectively in the trial. Uh, I think uh, uh, Robert Turner uh, contacted uh, Alastair Gray in the mid-1990s. Uh, so that enabled the, the inclusion of cost uh, uh, and resource use instruments in the, in the study. Uh, and also the collection of quality of life back uh, in 1997 of all 3,000 patients or all that could be contacted who filled out an EQ5D. And uh, again, these were for a landmark uh, um, uh, sort of, I suppose, uh, for the time in terms of integrating economics into the randomised trial. Also in the analysis, uh, the outcomes were extrapolated using a simulation model, which again, I think was a, I don't know if it was a first, but it was certainly an early example. And I think what is a first, it was one of the first uses of what's become uh, acceptability curves in terms of ways of presenting uncertainty. And again, these were all innovations from the, well, led by Alistair and, uh, uh, and, and the sort of team in Oxford. Um, my own uh, sort of, I suppose I started after this initial paper, and, uh, but I worked on a series of economic evaluations culminating what became UKPDS 72, which was the 72nd publication from the study. And I think just to give you one, uh, the results in the slide, uh, and these were just based on the trial results, not the extended follow-up uh, results, was all of the interventions were cost-effective and perhaps I would stress when it comes to the blood glucose intervention, they, uh, these were using perhaps an older generation of uh, less expensive therapies and I think one needs to re-examine these questions depending on the price of the medications and the, and the effectiveness of perhaps newer drugs. Um, but definitely uh, tight blood pressure was only a few hundred pounds per quality and metformin, even though it was a small study, uh, a relatively small randomization within the UKPDS, it had this uh, uh, quite dramatic effect and what that actually led to one of the rare cases where 
a, uh, a, a drug, which was uh, metformin was a relatively cheap drug, was not only increasing qualities but also uh, reducing costs. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, they were all perhaps important evidence for adoption of these therapies in routine practice. Um, but we, we, I suppose after we'd finished the trial analysis, we then thought we could actually start to use this data for other purposes and in particular to look at the epidemiology of the disease and build models that health economists could use to better extrapolate outcomes. And perhaps just to return to, um, uh, you know, to using the sort of perspective of history, well if you think back to uh, Ackland's work with cholera, uh, you know, basically he was trying to collect uh, a va vast variety of what were environmental risk factors and look at correlations visually. We're trying to do the same thing. We had about 20 years of data on 5,000 patients. I think importantly we had uh, data collected annually which was useful to, in terms of trying to understand the, uh, the, the time paths people took in terms of the, the, the sort of risk factors they had over, over uh, a substantial period of time and then connect those with a, a variety of complications uh, and of course had a benefit of computers and not just staring at graphs like this. Uh, so what did we do? Well we tried to build simulation models I think at the time and when I've and these, this uh, uh, simulation model was first published in 2004 it looked I suppose quite advanced and now I think with, thing, uh, with machine learning uh, and uh, you know that it, things have perhaps caught up in terms of, or the world has caught up in terms of and probably gone beyond in terms of the approaches to modeling uh, or relationships between risk factors and, uh, and outcomes. But what we did was basically uh, included a large number of uh, individual risk factors in what are known as survival equations but linked these equations to try to create as it were a person who could suffer or, or, or in, in, encounter various types of complications based on their risk profile. So perhaps to explain the model in a very fairly intuitive way, uh, one might imagine a simulation and what we've done is uh, basically use the various equations to calculate probabilities of events happening. As you can see and perhaps the reason why diabetes is a complex disease or it, disease to model is, is because there are so many uh, things that can happen to you uh, including uh, macrovascular events like myocardial infarction, stroke etc, amputation, blindness and using the uh, uh, basically the equations based on a, a patient's characteristics which we've defined here we can calculate probabilities for that patient in a uh, particular year of experiencing each of these events. We use what's called a Monte Carlo uh, simulation which means to determine if something happens, you've got a probability of something happening, life is full of chance and so basically we compare each of the probabilities with a random number and we basically to determine whether the event really happens. You, you might have a risk, sometimes it happens, in this case uh, the, uh, um, we, we predicted that or, or the uh, random number was less than the probability so a congestive heart failure event occurred it wasn't fatal, fatal, so the person then cycles through the model. We update the risk factors, we re-enter them in. This time, importantly, once you've had congestive heart failure, as most, many people would know in the room, your risks of other things happening increase. And in particular, having a heart attack uh, uh, go, goes up dramatically. And so in this case, uh, uh, the person has both a heart attack and that they die in the second cycle of the model and uh, so we can, but, but, uh, we can then uh, you know, re-enter uh, another patient in and average across these to get long-term expectations of what might occur based on the levels of risk factors and uh, 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 the, uh, I suppose the, these probabilities uh, to, to get long-term expected outcomes. And so once you average across a very large number of patients, in this case the UK PDS patients, you can try and estimate for example the benefits of conventional therapy which are around about two or three months extra life. One of the clinicians did quip at the time, that's about the same t the time people would have spent in the clinics as it were waiting to see a doctor but I'll, I'll, uh, that may well be true but uh, uh, that's, it, it's obviously uh, uh, sort of also beneficial time one can spend with one's grandchildren and uh, uh, for other purposes. Uh, um, but again just showing how long the uh, or the extrapolation we, we uh, uh, have to even in a trial that was a, a trial of unusual length 
uh, to actually uh, to, to extrapolate out over people's entire lifetimes. Now we're extremely fortunate with the UK PDS that we're going to get our 30 year follow up data where uh, and patients now have been followed up to, I think, 40 years. And so we will actually be able to look imp empirically whether our predictions were, were accurate or not in the, uh, over the coming years or over the coming year. Um, so, I, but having said that, uh, these models focus on the individual and I think we should move back to the population. Uh, I, what I would argue is there's now very compelling evidence that you can improve the lives of people with diabetes through better blood glucose control, better uh, cholesterol, uh, better, better blood pressure control and reducing cholesterol. And I think one of the things we have to do, do is have a think about how well we're actually doing. Uh, it's nice in theory and it's nice to do research, but how much of this is being adopted uh, in general, in practice. And one of the things that uh, we've uh, uh, tried to do uh, most recently uh, with a, a collaborator in Ant Antwerp, Guido Rigas, uh, is to try to come up with metrics to think about sort of performance and, uh, uh, and we've, we've actually gone and used uh, perhaps uh, uh, or borrowed from um, ways of measuring inequality, uh, income inequality. Uh, and one of the ideas was by an economist, Jan Penn, and the idea was that you would order all of the people in a society based on the, their heights being equivalent to their income. Uh, and uh, what, you, what you would end up with, well, a few, as if were uh, giants and then a lot of fairly short people, basically, if you look at What we've done is ordered everyone based on their cardiovascular risk, as it were. And what we've tried then to do and, uh, uh, is uh, look at, as it were, and this is using US data, based on the actual patterns of use, how much their gains have been, and that, uh, that's between the blue and green line. But then we've then thought about if you extend it to universal use, if those people we can see in this US, and this is US national data from Ed Haynes, how much uh, additional lives could be saved, and it's quite substantial, or actually additional cardiovascular events could be, could be prevented, and it's quite uh, substantial. And so we're trying to uh, produce statistics that try and not measure what we've achieved, but how much further there is to go. And uh, this is a recent paper uh, where we've tried to use poverty type measures to try to look at, uh, to, to measure, and poverty measures normally use a threshold of income. Here we're using a threshold of cardiovascular risk. So if you, if clearly, and, and, and around about, in the US data and in the UK data, around about half the people who are at high risk don't take the, the uh, don't take the drugs or aren't prescribed the drugs. So there's clearly quite substantial gaps. So the first issue as an economist, you're then going to think is how are we going to pay for this? And clearly uh, if quantity is going to rise and uh, in, in, inexorably for aging the population, but also closing the, these, these gaps and uh, uh, what can we do? And well, one of the tricks one can pull is to think about paying lower prices and uh, uh, now, of course, we can use new technologies, but that does tend to drive up prices. But there are all, is also, and perhaps a key message, there are now a lot of effective drugs that were very expensive a decade ago, and we should be able to be using more of these to treat uh, drug, uh, diseases like diabetes. And why do prices fall? Well, uh, uh, well, because uh, dr as drugs age, they go off patent, and this is not a, a very normal process. As uh, uh, you, people familiar with mobile phones, the uh, Lovastatin, the first statin, was approved around the same time that was the mobile phone you'd be buying. And clearly, uh, over the course of the last uh, 30 years, phones have got a lot better. They've also got a lot cheaper. And generally, the long run uh, price for any sort of large scale manufactured product is around about 1% to 2% of its original price. And that's true of uh, drugs like the uh, statins. So it's something, I think it's an enormous, but gain, of course, we gain, uh, you know, gain from using cheap phones, but also from using cheap drugs. Having said that, it's not always the case. And I think the UK is very fortunate uh, that to pay low prices for many of its generic medications. But as you can see from he here, if you compare it to other countries, and here's some work I did in Australia about a decade ago, partly because I was stunned when I started comparing the prices, uh, that the prices were so much higher in Australia than in the UK. And as you can see in England, there's a very rapid uh, uh, transition to low prices, and I think it's even more rapid today. In Australia, it's much slower. 
Why was that? Well, someone's making money. Uh, in this case, it was probably a combination between pharmacists and the pharmaceutical industry. But generally, uh, I think what you've got to do as an economist, it's a little bit like seeing unnecessary deaths. You've got to basically call this out and try and draw attention to it. And that's what I kind of did when I was back in Australia. As you can see, and somebody who had never, who had always published in, ac in academic papers, I uh, published this graph and a, a few weeks later the government did a deal or the then government did a deal with the pharmaceutical manufacturers which could maintain prices at a high, generic prices at a high level. So I kind of went public and as you can see uh, I had an article in uh, what was then uh, uh, the Australian newspaper and probably what was better was the, the alongside my article was the, uh, the uh, cartoon that kind of characterised uh, uh, some of the losses. And then I think what I realised over the next five or six years was you basically have to have a good graph to tell a convincing argument. And there's no better graph than comparing these sort of, you don't need statistics when visually you've got such large differences between countries. And uh, needless to say, what I would say is Australia has reformed uh, its, its drug pricing and they, they don't look like that today. But certainly, I think there is a real role for, for economists to say that this is, this is uh, a real waste and you could spend your money on much better things. What I probably didn't kind of uh, manage to get to in Australia was the second story, which is when drugs get cheaper, doctors in Australia, unlike the UK, tend to uh, prescribe less of them. They basically switch towards the more expensive drugs. Not, not universally, but as you can see, pretty compelling evidence when simvastatin came off uh, patent in the UK. It's, uh, it, it's uh, 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 um, actually, sorry, the patented, uh, percentage of patented formulations, which would have been Atorva and then later Resuva, uh, was a continu in continuous decline. In Australia, it was basically in continuously increasing. And I've got to say, of course, I would argue one of these uh, medical communities is wrong. They're making the wrong call. But as an economist, I would be much more inclined to stand with UK doctors so than, than Australian doctors on, on this in terms of what we know about the incremental benefit of, the, of the, uh, what were then the more expensive patented statins over taking something like uh, the gen cheaper generic ones. Um, I would argue beyond uh, countries like Australia and uh, the United Kingdom that uh, generic drugs uh, uh, can really now make a difference globally. Uh, you know, and, and basically I think many co drugs cost, as I said, less than five cents a day. You could put together several of them uh, and, uh, for treatments of chronic diseases. And so I think it has a similar sort of impact in the developmental terms to cheap mobile phones, which of course have revolutionised many parts of, of the world in terms of not only for communication, but also for trade. Um, but what is, I think, important, and again, there's nothing like a graph to call a problem out, is that if you compare the price we pay in the UK with, say, the prices in many developing countries for a drug like simvastatin, these are many multiples. And again, I, what I, I don't know individually in the case, but someone is making money out of this. These drugs should be at uh, a world, a very low world price. One of the ideas I've got, and I'd like to uh, 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 pursue this uh, uh, here in Oxford, is to develop kind of something like a Big Mac index and publish this regularly and have a, ta a league table showing who's paying the most expensive prices in the world for generic drugs. But that's still something uh, as, as sort of work in progress. Again, uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, 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 perhaps another pricing problem, particularly, well, which is, is, is now uh, very much a, 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 an issue in the United States, has been the rising price of insulin. Uh, so, so the uh, newer an, a, a, a analog insulins, uh, um, basically, although many of them are coming off patent, what has been happening is their list prices have been rising. And this was a PhD student of mine, uh, Jing Yang, who has actually joined, joined us here in Oxford in the NPEU. But this uh, graph has sort of so, has become fairly uh, iconic and has, for example, been used uh, in evidence before the uh, uh, and con con congressional committees looking at why the price of insulin has risen so dramatically over the last uh, uh, um, two decades. Uh, and there's very complex reasons, but again, I think one needs to come up with, with uh, solutions to, to make things uh, in the US are, are more affordable. So if we return back to the start, uh, to, uh, to uh, treating cholera, uh, what, was, uh, what did the Victorians spend? And I just did these calculations an hour.
go, but I'm, one of the things I found out was in 1890, a pound bought you five US dollars, which uh, it strikes me that uh, <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't quite go as far today. Um, but if you convert it over to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, UK pounds and then uh, inflate it up for a century worth of inflation, you get about 14 billion, which is a reasonable amount. It's about the entire equivalent of the entire pharmaceutical expenditure in the UK for a year. And it's, I mean, but it's, it's affordable, but it's a lot, it was a lot of money for its time. And I would perhaps stress, if you were wealthy in the Victorian times, if you lived in North Oxford, cholera and the, these you know, waterborne diseases didn't really impact on you. So it really was, I think, an attempt, I mean, a, a significant expenditure to act, but, but to, to sort of, you know, reduce inequalities it, and benefit uh, the society more generally. Uh, treating diabetes, uh, I think uh, the, perhaps the key messages is uh, one needs to perhaps, uh, uh, as I said, close treatment gaps. I think, well, where possible, using cost-effective generic medications. Uh, I think uh, this is not only going to improve population health, but we really should be trying to, to tackle inequalities and target the, the, uh, the you know, diabetes and other chronic diseases in uh, uh, those of, with uh, low socioeconomic status. I do think there's a need to reduce the price of insulin in the United States. I think tripling is, is, is problematic. But, but more generally, I think having a low-cost generic insulin available to all people in the world should be an objective. And if you, I think there's probably, and we've tried to do some calculations recently, there's probably as many people dying for want of insulin in the world, perhaps, perhaps as, I mean, I mean, you know, a, a significant number. And we should be thinking in a similar fashion to AIDS with the Millennium Fund uh, to think about ways to make drugs available. Uh, and I think $14 billion is a good start to achieve some of these <laughs> objectives. So just to perhaps a few thank yous. Uh, uh, so in terms of obviously, and I tried to count up, and I may have missed some people here, but I basically, uh, I tried to count up all those people I'd written papers with so far. There's a few actual papers in progress that I could add, but I w would hope over my time as director, I would, would uh, work with, with or, or, you know, everyone in HERC on uh, 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 various sort of uh, research projects. Uh, here is, is uh, the, the uh, HERC uh, taken last year, just before I became director. And here are some, I think, examples uh, beyond research papers of where Herc has contributed to the discipline in terms of making two very sort of popular textbooks, uh, which have uh, uh, had uh, you know um, uh, numerous authors, many of which are here today. Um, just perhaps to answer the perhaps the uh, question of what was I looking back in 1969? Does anyone want to have a guess? <laughs> yes. So that was for the opera house I would have looked at. This was the uh, opera house where this is, was uh, where I, Sydney was where I went, met my wife, Sonia, uh, who, as you can see, is sort of having a, a, uh, a uh, cafe latte or a, uh, a cappuccino uh, uh, looking at Sydney Harbour. But I, what I would say is perhaps we've, what we've done is obviously uh, come to Oxford to spend the next phase of our life here with a view by the river. <laughs> Thank you.